This is The Secret Library, a podcast about writing and publishing books. I'm Caroline Donahue, a life coach who works with writers, and I'm here to tell you this is your year. It's time to stop waiting and start writing. The Secret Library podcast is supported by our wonderful Patreon supporters. Thank you, everybody. You can join the Writers Club for the show and get solo episodes and the chance to submit questions for monthly Q&A audio at patreon.com slash secret library. This is episode 150 of the Secret Library podcast. I'm very excited about that. And even more exciting, my guest this week is Chip Cheek. His first novel, Cape May, is out this month. His stories have appeared in the Southern Review, Harvard Review, Washington Square, and other journals and anthologies. He has been awarded scholarships to the Breadloaf Writers Conference, the Tin House Summer Writers Workshop, and the Vermont Studio Center, as well as an Emerging Artist Award from the St. Botolf Club Foundation in Boston. For many years, Chip taught fiction at Grub Street in Boston, but he now lives in El Segundo, California with his wife and daughter. I am really excited to share this episode because Chip has a really fascinating story about how the novel Cape May came to exist. And for anyone who's been slogging through an idea that they felt obligated to write only to see something glimmering on the horizon or a subplot that seemed to take over and have a much more exciting, immediate, delicious Um, enticing process in terms of writing. You'll love listening to Chip and how Cape May came to exist. And I have never heard actually a more thrilling description of writing a first draft than, than what Chip describes in this episode about writing the first draft of Cape May. I was actually a little jealous and I think you will be too, but it will motivate you to think really hard about what matters about your story and, and what you want most out of your book. And to think about, you know, if something feels too hard, maybe there's a way to make it easier. Maybe there's a way to make it more fun. So I hope you're inspired by listening to this. I know it's it's raised many questions for me ever since we had this conversation. And I know you're going to love hearing from Chip Cheek. Hey, Chip, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It's such such an honor to be on your uh, podcast. Thanks. So I'm really excited to talk about Cape May for one reason, which I did not tell you before. I have been to Cape May, so that was really fun to read about. Obviously not in the time period that you wrote about, but (laughs) I loved thinking about, I actually had a friend growing up who had, their family had a, a weekend, kind of a weekend house and a vacation rental. And so we went a couple of times. And so I loved thinking about what was happening in the other houses while I was reading this book. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I always, I always get a little like nervous when I hear people who say, you know, they've been to Cape May or people who are from Cape May. I've heard it, you know, a couple oh, of those. That's I'm a like, good one. Oh, God, I, you know, I, I really meant to make that research trip to Cape May. I never quite made it before, <laughs> before finishing the book, but I, I, I hope it came off uh, well. <laughs> oh my God. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> I totally, I totally thought you were like old school. Had spent a bunch of time there. It was like in your uh-huh. family. No, no, it's a uh, so um, my friend uh, Lizzie Stark, who's a who's a writer friend of mine. I knew her from uh, grad school. Um, when we were in grad school, she and and I and uh, some of our friends used to go to Cape May to her, her family has a beach house down there. And we used to go to Cape May, uh, for writing retreats. Um, and we'd usually go in the off season. And, um, I, I came to, I love the place. Uh, you know, I really, I, I love the, the feel of it, you know, the architecture. Um, and we used to, you know, we would go during a time of the year when it's pretty emptied out. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, we used to go pretty regularly, you know, maybe two or three times a year, but, uh, but that's, that's, that's how I know it. Well, I think that's perfectly adequate. I mean, you don't need to go and be like, who's the mayor and I'm going to meet them. And, you know, if the book isn't about that. Right, exactly. Yeah, and I, you know, it's it's definitely a fictionalized, you know, version of the town. I mean, you know, there is um, there is no New Hampshire Avenue, which is the the, the avenue where the house is in, in the book, but there is a neighborhood where all the uh, street names are state names. So, so it's kind of like a it, it's plausible, but it's not, you know, exactly mapping onto the reality of the place. That's so sneaky. I love it. <laughs> So I'm really interested. So you spent this time in Cape May doing writing retreats. And then yeah. how did the how did the story appear to you? Did it come through the place or did you think of the characters and then this 
definitely had to be set in Cape May. I'm just curious where the idea started. Sure, sure. Um, it, so I I had before writing this book, um, I had been struggling to write uh, this this other novel, um, this uh, uh, novel that was uh, this dark, violent novel set in Georgia in the 20s. Actually, it's uh, based on you know uh, my my own family history. I'm I'm from Georgia, and my my family's from Georgia, going back. You know, generations, um, and I was struggling to 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 write this book, um, but I kept getting sidetracked by love stories. Um, I would, you know, I would, I would, you know, to try to like jumpstart my my process or to try to, you know, like uh, get some get some traction going. I would say, well, you know, maybe who's who's this guy into, you know, and and uh, and I kept sending people off into the woods together. You know, they'd be skinny dipping, and then I'd have to backtrack and be like, wait a second, this has nothing to do with this has nothing to do with the the the, um, the novel I'm writing. Um, so with, so with Kate May, I, I started this book before realized, before I knew that I was starting this book. So I married, uh, my po- point of view character, this guy, Henry, um, to a then relatively minor character, Effie, um, in this dark novel. And I sent them off on a honeymoon and I just kind of picked Kate May because I, I thought it would be, you know, it's, it's very different for them. Um, uh, you know, these Southerners c- coming up, you know, I thought it'd be interesting to bring, you know, uh, for them to go to a place where they would feel, you know, there'd be more, they'd be out of place. Um, but also it's just because, you know, I had, I, I, I liked the atmosphere of the place, you know, from having done writing retreats there. Um, so once I did that, uh, sent them on a honeymoon, um, for reasons that made sense at the time, I couldn't stop writing. And in two or three days I had 50 pages and I realized that, the book I'd been working on for the past two or three years, uh, I, I, I dumped it in the trash <laughs> and uh, realized that I had started a new novel. Wow. Yeah. And and then I, I wrote the rest of it in a fever. I mean, I wrote, uh, this was uh, the summer after um, my wife and I got married, which it probably isn't a coincidence. <laughs> um, so, you know, marriage was on the mind. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so the, the summer of 2015, 20, 2014. Um, I, I wrote this book and finished the first draft in two months. Um, I didn't didn't look bad, and I, I never write that way. I've never written anything like that before. Um, so this was amazing. I remember making a note to myself: "This is how this should feel <laughs> uh, next time around." You know, pay, pay attention to, to to this how this feels right now because this is how a first draft should feel. That's incredible. I think this is something that seems to happen. I keep hearing about this. I mean, this is interesting given the the content of the book itself, which is a lot about, you know, people getting their eye caught in different directions. But it feels like that can happen to writers as well. Like you write the book that you think you're supposed to write sort of like, you know, it almost makes me think of the book Henry receives as a gift, a book, which is about like how to be an upstanding citizen, which he's attempting to read early on in the book. And I feel like sometimes writers take on their novels that way, like, okay, I'm going to read this book, or I'm going to write this book, that's going to make me a, you know, in quotes, good writer. And that's the, the book that we write. And then there's this other book that kind of comes in in like a swishy negligee and says, hey, hey, I'm over here. Don't you want to write about me? <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah, that's exactly right. I love that. Um, yeah, it's so like, I mean, it's like, I, I know I knew this, I, I, I've known this for a long time that, you know, like, I used to tell my students this, you know, it's like, you know, your quote, unquote, um, important book doesn't have to be like about big, important, you know, like, murder or race or war, you know, um, I knew that, like, I mean, you know, the, the, any subject, uh, depending on, you know, how it's treated, it can be, you know, the subject of great fiction, great literature. Um, I knew that. And yet when I'm at my, at my desk, you know, I'm thinking, no, this is the important book I need to write, you know? Um, and, and I think though I was always, you know, drawn to write about desire and sex and love and those, that kind of thing. I think I didn't really, I didn't really deep down believe that it was an important subject for, for writing until finally I just gave into it, you know, and I realized that like the themes in my previous novel, which had to do with the South and, and race, um, and, and murder, um, were deeply intellectually interesting to me. They weren't, um, on, you know, on a sort of visceral level, like transportive for me, like the, the most urgent dramas in my own relatively privileged life have to do with love and desire and sex. Right. <laughs> and so that's the book. That's the book I had to write. Um, and it did come, come in, in a, in a sparkly dress and say, Hey, look at me. And I said, awesome. Nice. 
Yeah, yeah. I feel like there is something, I mean, this is something I'm noticing lately, that there is this kind of question that that comes in about including sex, sexuality, those kinds of issues in literary fiction. It's almost like, are we allowed to do this? Um, I, I talked with Saskia Vogel about this, who recently wrote Permission, which has a dominatrix in the center of a literary novel. So it's there is this trick about where do you end up in the bookstore if you write about sex versus murder? Totally fine. Stay in the literary section. You know, you can write about certain topics and they can be really intensely presented with a lot of graphic content. And you're totally good to stay in the literary fiction. But there's something about sex. I don't know why this is, but it still makes it feel like we're super puritanical about it being included in the literary canon. Mm hmm. So, yeah, definitely. I mean, I just just this past weekend, I taught um, uh, with my my friend Whitney Scherer, um, uh, taught a uh, session uh, at, the, at the Muse conference on writing sex scenes. Um, so this is kind of front of mind right now. <laughs> um, but but yeah, no, I, I, I hear you. I think, you know, I think we have very um, conflicting attitudes about sex, you know, in this in this uh, in, in our culture. I mean, on, on the one hand, you know, we're obsessed with it. Um, but on the other hand, it's, it's a uh, forbidden and shameful. Um, uh, you know, you can, you know, to your point about violence, you know, you can have a movie, uh, that like could have a field of dead corpses, you know, and it's probably, it could have a PG rating, you know, but you show a, a penis or a vagina and it's like instant R, you know, maybe NC 17, you know, I think we're just ashamed of it, you know, in this weird way, even, even as we're obsessed with it. Yeah. I mean, it's where we come from, you know, violence is kind of an yeah. ending by necessity right. versus, yeah. I mean, sex can be a beginning in many ways. I mean, it can be an ending if handled certain ways, but I think this topic is really interesting in terms of, so this novel comes in in a sparkly dress. You're writing your, your big novel in quotes, bold type with an underline about mm -hmm. the South and your, your family. And this sparkly dress comes in and, and then you're pulled away. How much of the story was apparent to you right away? Or were you just following along with this honeymoon? saying, okay, some things are going to happen. But did they surprise you along the way as much as they surprised the reader? They did. They did. Um, you know, I am, I was just kind of, it's so cheesy, but I was just really transported. Like, I mean, I, um, I, I didn't know what was going to happen next. I mean, I think as I got into the, you know, as, as I got into the arc of the story, I began to see, you know, where it would go. You know, the further I got in, the more I knew what was going to happen. You know, um, you see the, the, the shape, begins to reveal itself to you. Um, but certainly in those early stages, it was just, um, you know, two characters in a certain situation, characters I knew well, because they had kind of come from this previous novel, so I already knew them well, um, uh, in this in this situation that was just, you know, loaded with tension. Uh, and honestly, I think, you know, for any, for, with any, starting off on any project, that's really all you need, you know? Um, I, I'm, you know, and some people believe, you know, in, in outlining, um, uh, I, I'm not one of those people. I think when, when I when I know a story too well beforehand, uh, it it all its power is lost to me. Um, and I always try to I've always done this, try to like hold on to the mystery of the story. Even in revision, I try to like not try to understand my story too fully, um, because if if everything is known, then there is um, th there is th somehow the life is drained out of it for me. Um and so, yeah, with this one, it was just Henry and Effie and Kate May and let's see what happens. Um, and then, you know, the, the window clicked on across the street and that here's someone else here and let's see what happens, you know, and that's, that's, that's really how it, how it, how it happened. And I, I was just riveted, you know, I mean, it was honestly one of those things where like I would get up early in the morning. Um, I, I had a part-time job then that in the afternoon, so I'd get up early in the morning and I would write for three or four hours and then go into work. And then later that night, you know, my wife and I would be, you know, watching television or something. And then she would go to bed and I would think, let me, let me just look at my novel. I'm just going to go just take a peek at it. And then suddenly it'd be three in the morning. Yeah. Um, I just could not pull myself away from it. I, it's, it was, it was the most engrossing, uh, absorbed experience I've ever had as a writer. That's so great. Mm -hmm. I think this is something that we think about a lot is the, you know, trusting the direction of the story that, mm -hmm. you know, if I don't have an outline, will it, will I wander around like an idiot in the darkness for the rest of my life? You know, right. I, I don't know if anyone else shares this fear. I definitely have it. Is, 
will there be a logic that shows up if I write without planning and just ask good questions along the way? I think this is something that a lot of people wonder about. Right, right. I mean, I, you know, it's, I think for, for the first, you know, we're talking about the first draft here, you know, and I, I, I would just quote one of my, you know, great mentors, Margot Livesey, uh, the novelist Margot Livesey, who says, uh, you know, believe in the optimism of revision, <laughs> you know, and so I think, you know, for that first draft to go wild, you know, uh, and try not try to think as little as possible. <laughs> um, and then you can do all your worrying and fretting when you rewrite the book, you know, um, um, I, I really believe in that. Now, it's really hard. I mean, here I am, you know, trying to trying to get back into a new thing. And so I know how difficult it is um, to do that. But um, but uh, but, you know, I think just, you know, to, uh, don't, you know, let let, let your let yourself go wild if, if possible, because I think then you're really going to, you know, if you're not over intellectualizing it, uh, you're going to find the stuff that really matters to you, um, the stuff that's if you feel a thrill or, or maybe even better, if you feel afraid, uh, you're probably hitting the good stuff. Yeah. I think, I think that's really true. On the one hand, I, I, I'm loving your thought process about, remember, this is what it's supposed to feel like. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there is this point in finishing that does get really hard. And so I think sometimes we can spend two to three years stuck in a story like you're talking about only to realize there's another story. But I think I often have the fear when it morphs like that, that it's just going to keep morphing and that nothing mm -hmm. is ever going to be finished. So how do you, Got it. how do you see the balance of maintaining this, this kind of excitement and intensity and, and being riveted and also kind of keeping focused enough to get to the end and actually finish the book? Yeah, right. Um, that that's a it's a great question. I, I, I wish I had a really intelligent, cogent way of uh, answer to it. But um, <laughs> I think you know the, the best I can come up with is like you know it when you when you got it. You know, you, like you, when you feel it, you know it. Um, I you know with the, with the previous novel, it wasn't like I was like you know, engrossed in writing and then, and then got distracted. It was like, I was grinding and spinning my wheels. It was an unpleasant experience. Um, uh, there would be, there would be certain, you know, there'd be bursts of creativity and productivity, but then I would come to a brick wall, you know, and it was just, I I'd spent, and it wasn't just that one novel. I'd probably, you know, I'd really spent like five years just trying to write ad novel at any novel. Um, and, uh, and it was, uh, it, it was so frustrating because I felt like I wasn't getting anywhere. Um, with Kate May, once I sent them on this honeymoon and I took off running, it felt like nothing I'd ever felt before. It was a categorically different sensation. And so I knew I was onto something then. It, it was absolutely clear to me. There was absolutely no, I, I didn't have that fear of like, maybe this will, maybe I'll just run out of steam. No, I just, I just decided to follow it. And I remember thinking like, okay, this is the kind of book I'm writing about. You know, it's, it's, these characters don't stand for anything. They're just, these particular characters, uh, they, they, they're not like America in the South or whatever, you know, they're just Henry and Effie. And there's a, apparently this is going to be a book about a lot of sex, you know? And I remember having this thought like, you know what? I, I'm, I'm done. Like, I'm so, I'm so frustrated. If, if all I'm doing is writing a smutty book, that's what I am. I guess I'm a smutty book writer, you know? <laughs> and, and I just, uh, gave myself over to it. Um, but of course, by the time, by, by the time I started nearing the end, um, in that first draft, I realized that I had something a lot, a lot bigger, a lot deeper than that. And once I finished that first draft and I took a step away from it, um, and I looked at it through the lens of what I saw in it, not what was in the page, but what I saw and believed in it. Then I, then I saw the, you know, the beautiful object I wanted to make it, you know, I, I saw it and it was worth working a number, uh, two or three years of work that wasn't euphoric you know there was a lot of there were some despairing times um in revising and rewriting this book um but i knew i saw what i wanted it to be and there and i was never going to let that go I, I knew i would never be distracted i knew i was going to finish this book so i'm wondering if you could take us through that revision process a little bit so you've got two months of euphoric oh my god i'm just going to look in on this and i'm up till three in the morning can't look away sparkly dress excitement so then how did you go about working on it those couple of years it took to get it where it is now? 
Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's great. I, I love focusing on that. I think I too often when I talk about this book, focus on that initial burst of euphoria. Um, but no, most of the time, obviously, yeah, it was, this, was, was the work. Um, so after finishing it, so the first draft was uh, what, I, what I considered a beautiful train wreck. I mean, it was a total train wreck. <laughs> um, it was the, the previous, like, as I said before, it came out of this previous novel. That previous novel was written in the first person and it was set in the 20s. So for the first like third of the first draft, it was first person from Henry's point of view set in the 20s. Um, oh, wow. Once, yeah. Once I realized that I was writing that, that I, I was writing a, no, a new novel, I understood that it was no longer tethered to that previous time period. So without backtracking, just going forward, I decided to experiment with other time periods. So I would wake up one day and be like, what if it was set let's say in the depression, you know, and I'd write, I'd, you know, I would just keep writing as if it was set in the depression. Then I, I played with World War II time period and Henry's about to get shipped off to the Pacific, you know? Wow. I, I flirted with the 60s and the 70s. Um, I even very, very, very briefly flirted with the present day. Um, and, and, that, and, and that's what I did through the, through the first draft. Um, when I came to the end of the first draft, um, for the next four or five months, what I really struggled with, and it was a real struggle to the point of almost despair, um, because it began to seem so arbitrary, was when is this thing set? <laughs> like, I didn't know that I'd, I had to decide the time period. And I had no idea when that would be. So I uh, finally in so I finished, I finished the draft at the beginning of September. In January, early to mid January, I had a meeting with my writing group. Um, and I should say that I'm blessed. Um, to be in like the best writing group ever. The, uh, we call ourselves the chunky monkeys. Um, yes. uh, uh, Christopher, uh, yeah. Castellani is in the group. Celeste Ng is in the book, uh, in the group, uh, Whitney share, um, and, uh, and, and, and others, just an amazing group of, of writers, uh, and, 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 you know, my, my best friends and, and, and just really intimidating critics as well. Um, so in January of that, of that year, 2015, I guess it would be, I, I brought in a sample chapter, um, for my group to read and they, um, they gave it the stamp of approval. They said, this is awesome. Um, and then when we talked about time period, we kind of, it seemed to seemed like the fifties was the best time period. Uh, they, they helped me sort of see that. And the reason for that is because if it was set, so the, the story came first, like the sort of big things that happen in the book are all present there in the first draft. Um, um, that, that all of that sort of stayed into the final form that's here now. So really the story was there. It was like, what time period would be most meaningful for the story mm. and decided that any, anything much too, too much earlier than the fifties and the action wouldn't be very plausible. Um, wouldn't be plausible enough And anything too far after the fifties and the action would begin to lose some of its charge. You know, I mean, you, you think about Kate May set in the present day, it's almost kind of like, eh, who cares? <laughs> you know, like, right. Um, um, no, that the fifties is where it has the most meaningful charge. So, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's funny, like, you know, the, the marketing copy and the reviews and all that talk about like how this is, you know, talks about, you know, it's like about fifties America and an exploration of that. And what's funny is that's not, that's not the case at all. You know, I mean, uh, the story came first, I picked the time period that seemed to make, uh, you know, fit best with it. And then this is the magic of revision. You revise it to make it seem like that's what you intended all along. Right. Of course. Um, so after I made, after it came down on that decision, I, um, I spent probably the next year and a half, two years, honestly, suffering. I mean, suffering over the first three chapters, say, I mean, how to open the book was a huge challenge. And I just, it was n nothing more, you know, nothing more secret than just grinding through trying, trying every, you know, iteration of just, of just, of that first chapter. And the first chapter was a bear to write. Um, but finally I had for the first three chapters, I thought was in really good shape. Uh, and it seemed like for a while that I would never have anything more than that. It seemed like I would never be able to bring myself to finish this book. I was just, I, I was kind of in a rut there for a little bit. Um, and then in November of 2016, which is a momentous month for the world, I guess. Um, yes. Yeah, in many ways. So um, many. Oh, God. Um, but one other huge momentous thing that happened in my life was that um, Katie, you know, before we found out we were pregnant. And so um, that put in an, a very clear deadline on this book. Um, and so I 
raced to finish this book before, um, before Audrey, our, our daughter was born. Um, I, I've never been so productive in my life. I, I think I, I, I had, I mean, I obviously I'm a dad now and I know, you know, my writing career is going to continue, you know, right. Um, uh, but I had this dreary thought that I wouldn't finish the book. The baby would come, you know, I'd feel resentful, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like I just, I just saw a bleak future ahead of me if I didn't finish this book yeah. um, as, as irrational as that, as, as that really was, it was enough to power me to finish it. And I, I just, I, it was like a bender of writing. I just, for the next, those next nine months, I just wrote my ass off. And I, I finished, I finished the book in like j- j- the end of June of 2017. I gave it to my writing group. They read it over the next month. Uh, we met about it. And four days after that meeting, uh, my daughter was born. Wow. Um, I mean, I was, it was like right down to the wire. Um, and uh, a month after Audrey was born, I kind of came out of the you know fog of of new babyhood to um, to make you know a few edits and send it off to to an agent to an agent I, I really you know was was wanted to be my agent and and she she uh, loved it and signed with me and the rest is history. So one thing I am curious about is can you say more about? the process of getting the the first chapter where you wanted it to be. Can you share some of the things that you tried? Was it a question of the tone and the voice or was it a question of where does this start and at what point in the story do we start? I'm just curious about where you were getting stuck and if you can share a little bit of the inside process there. Sure, sure. Um yeah, it was I I think I guess a lot of it was um where to start. Um very simple question of just where to start. Um in the first draft since it did it, I didn't know, you know, that I was starting a new book. So the first draft just sort of starts actually with their wedding. Um Oh wow. Uh, yeah, it starts with their wedding and then they go off and and then it follows them pretty closely on the train ride up, you know, um and uh up to Cape May and you know so it it's very linear. Um and and I really, yeah, I just really struggled to um, figure out where exactly, you know, like, you know, do, do you start with the train ride? Do you start with, you know, I don't know. It was, it seems like such a small, in retrospect, such a small question. And like, why did that dog me for months? Um, but I just couldn't get the words right. Um, you know, it's just like, the, uh, I'm, I'm a meticulous, a very, very meticulous um, drafter, I should say. And I don't, I don't think that anyone should follow my example, um, <laughs> but I, I suffer over language. Um, this, uh, the, the I'm, I'm, I don't mean to, this is not bragging. This is, this is saying how OCD I am. Um, there was almost, there were almost no edits to this, to this book, um, after it sold to the publisher. I mean, we had a, my editor and I had a 30, 30 minute conversation about edits, um, on the, on the language. Um, you know, we patched up a little, you know, something at the end, you know, there are a couple of things, you know, in the middle that we adjusted, but when it comes to the language, it was just, you know, it was, there there was really not, you know, nothing to say there because I had so OCD, like suffered over every sentence, you know? Um, and, uh, and to, to, to a, to a fault, I mean, it's not healthy. Um, I need, I need to learn a different process, I guess. Um, but, but part of it was just that I just couldn't get the right words. The, the words didn't seem right. It didn't, it didn't, you know, part of that was the point of view too. I had to, I had to, you know, you know, I, like I said before, the first draft was written in the first person. Um, and I had to come to terms with the fact that that wasn't the right point of view for it. Um, and so I had to change it all into third person. Um, so that was a bit, you know, it, while preserving that voice that I had, that I, that I really liked in the first person. Um, so yeah, I think it was, a it was where to start and, and, uh, language, I guess. Yeah. And that was definitely a rambling answer. I'm sorry about that one. <laughs> no, no, that's, I think that's, I think that's all really important. And I think that, I think that's, there's, these things are the kinds of things that can stop you cold. And it's amazing about the things that just, you know, just throw a truck in the way. I mean, I have a very minor edit by comparison. Um, I don't usually talk about my book on the show, but I will say there's just one thing where um, a reader that I work with is like, I think you just need a few more paragraphs here. That is, that is like occupied my entire life for the past two weeks, like three yeah, paragraphs. Yeah. I got you. Yep. I understand that. Yep. And, and I'm like, but which ones? And and how do I start it? And is this the right, is this a, yeah. the exact right point of view for that. And, oh, it's so stupid. And I'm like, I, I, what is it with these three paragraphs? I know. Yep. Yep. And, I feel 
and I'm sure later I'll be like, obviously it was those three paragraphs. Why was that such a big deal? I mean, I think the beginning of your book feels kind of inevitable. Like it feels like, of course it starts as soon as they arrive. But I mean, right. how could you have known at the time? <laughs> yeah. 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 I um, didn't. Yeah. It, if, yeah. It should have been, maybe it should have been, you know, obvious, but yeah, it was, certainly wasn't to me. Um, yeah. Maybe there's a craft book that needs to be written called It Should Have Been Obvious, but then it's like <laughs> That's right. all of these yeah. things that you've struggled with, like, oh, it should, obviously it could have been in third person and that would make <laughs> things easier. Oh, I don't know. It's just well, these I think, decisions. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, that's really the magic of revision. I mean, I think that, you know, if, if you've revised well, if you've done it well, um, the whole book should feel inevitable, right? It should feel, it should feel this sort of like, ah, yes, this is exactly right. You know, uh, it couldn't be any other way, you know, um, that's, 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 it takes a lot of work to make it seem that way. Definitely. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a question and for everyone listening, please don't scream wherever you are and say, Oh my God, she's doing a spoiler. I'm not doing a spoiler. I'm not going to spoil it. I just have to ask a structural question because I think it's really important that we talk about this because we never talk about endings because I'm always afraid about spoilers. So I'm not going to talk about, and I don't think we should, anything that actually happened in the book. However, you chose to include what I'm going to call a coda, which is basically there are the major events of the book that are encompassed in a certain period of time. And then there is something, and it's not an afterword. It feels more like you get to see, it reminded me a little bit of, there's the um, the final season, the final episode of Six Feet Under, if anyone has seen, like you see, you get to see the rest right. of the characters' mm -hmm. lives play out. Right, right. So, mm -hmm. and and you chose to do that with this book. And I'm really interested in what inspired that choice and, and how that was writing a coda. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, th some, somehow I knew that the end was going to make that move. Um, and I think part of it had to do with this book, this story. I, I wanted to show that this story is a lot bigger than just these, you know, four or so weeks in Cape May. Um, the sort of the, you know, the, the, the weight and gravity of the events happening here, don't just affect this moment. They're going to affect their whole lives. Um, and, uh, and, and I wanted to show this is a story, not just about like hot people doing it in Cape May. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great title. Right. Is that the I mean, official that's... title? And just Cape May is the short version. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. <laughs> if it was sold more, maybe, um, or maybe but, the uh, paperback. Oh yeah. I like that. You know, it's yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll tell my editor that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, it's bigger than that. You know, it's a story about marriage. It's a story about, um, you know, uh, the, the, these, this, these characters lives. Uh, so I knew I was going to, I, I wanted to do that. And I knew I, I even had a sense of like, you know, the last few paragraphs. I mean, once I was about halfway through the, 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 even the first draft, um, I, I knew that, that I wanted it to end in, in that way. Um, and in terms of structurally, I was kind of, you know, inspired by, I love, Alice Monroe is one of my great, mm. great heroes. And, um, it's a move she does with a number of her stories, you know, where she, she has a short story and then the last two paragraphs might be cover 70 years, you know, um, it, it pulls back and shows the whole, the full context. I mean, her, her stories, you know, they're, they're, some of, some of the endings of her stories just turn and turn, you know, you think it could end here, but, but no, there's a paragraph about the next decade. And here's a paragraph that contradicts those events from that, that, secondary ending and there's actually a third ending, you know, um, that's right on her deathbed, you know, or whatever. Um, and I just think it's so beautiful and, and it's one of the ways she, um, makes her stories seem like novels, you know, um, they're big, you know, they're the, not in size, but in weight, you know? Um, and so I knew I wanted to, to try that. Um, it's funny people, people call it, yeah, they call it a coda. The people call it an epilogue. Um, uh, to me, it's just the chapter. It's just the last chapter and, and, and it, and it's just the time register speeds up. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. I think it stands out because there is this kind of, I think there's been this style or it's been sort of in vogue, I don't know how else to put it, for I think a couple of decades where you have this kind of ambiguous ending. You know, it's like, oh, who knows? Who knows how this plays out? You decide as the reader. And in some cases, it, it you can be left with a, oh, God, I really kind of wanted to know what happened. 
But also there is a, oh, okay, well, maybe I can, okay, I think I can puzzle it out and see what I think happened. But to see the impact of a big moment in characters' lives and to get to see how it plays out, I thought was really beautiful. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm good. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's had mixed reviews, you know, on, uh, in some of the early reviews, some people, I think most people, you know, are, are like it, but I, you know, a lot of people don't like it. Um, and I, I think that's fine. You know, obviously that's a, that's a, it's, it's a, it's a risk and, and uh, that's fine. But I, in, in a way, I don't think it's sort of, you know, it's, it's like what Robert Boswell calls authorial custody, you know, where you're kind of guiding the reader, like, this is what I mean you to think, you know, um, I, I don't think it does that. Like, I don't think it, it, it's, it, it shows what happens through the rest of their lives. It's not like just they lived happily or unhappily ever after. Um, but, but it doesn't, you know, it's still, it leaves a lot open for interpretation. I think there's still a lot of mystery in the, in the, in the, um, in the facts and a lot of, a lot to be, I think there's a lot to be debated about it too. I think it's something to do with the voice as well. Is that, the voice, I mean, these are some charged things that happen, but the voice is, is kind of, there's a light touch and, and maybe the thing about ending up in a different part of the store, so to speak, is that there isn't a lot of like saxophone playing in the background or a lot of like, bow, 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 kind of like, yeah. Yeah. Hey, this is what's happening now. It feels very much like, okay, here's a situation. This is what happened. Um, the narrator does not feel like somebody who's like outside the window, heavy breathing on the window, watching this whole thing. It's, it's very neutral. And I think that there's something about that, that, that lets you, yeah, have your own feelings about what is unfolding and to take what you will from it. Mm -hmm. Sure. And how was it to, to take Henry away from being the narrator and making him a character? And then you talked about preserving the voice yeah. that you had for Henry. How, how was it to go from first to third? That sounds like a beast. It, it was, it was a beast. Um, and that's, and I think that is, you know, when I'm talking about language, um, the, the difficulty of write, you know, re, uh, writing those first, uh, chapters, you know, that we were talking about earlier, I think, I think a lot of it did have to do with that transfer and, and figuring out the voice and figuring out the right words. Um, I, 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 I realized it had to be in the third person because this is, um, an extremely intimate story. It's about, it's about very, um, it's about, uh, I think I'm paraphrasing Jennifer Haig here, but it's, it's about what people do when they don't think anyone's looking. Um, and the first person just isn't as intimate as the third person, the, the first person, there's always this implied question, like, why are you telling me this? You know? Mm. And, Henry were to sit down and tell this story, you would be like, what you sick freak? Why are you telling me about your constipation? I don't want to hear about that. You know, like why, what does that have to do with anything? What, what, what's your agenda here? Um, whereas the third person is a much more, I realized is a much more intimate point of view because it can show us what Henry is feeling, doing, thinking when he doesn't think anyone's looking. It's, it's, it, we can sort of peer into more clearly into, um, what's happening. Um, uh, without the filter of a, of a, of a, of the, of a character's point of view. Um, and so I realized it had to be third person. I love that. I love the thought of third being more intimate than first, because we always think, oh, third is a little bit more distant. And then first you're inside. I mean, but of course you can be trapped in first because you're inside that head and you can't see what anyone else is doing, but we always think of it being closer. But I love the idea of of third being more intimate, which I agree. I think it is in this case. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's always, it, there's, I mean, it, there's always, uh, there's a distancing effect with first person. Cause you know, unless, unless you can kind of write it in such a way that it seems like a stream of conscious kind of thing where it's, where there's not a person speaking to another person, but in most first person narratives, um, it's, it's a narrator telling a story, you know? Um, and so there's always a sort of, why are you telling me this story that isn't as, that that question isn't as strong in the third person because it's sort of the, you know, default storytelling point of view. Yeah. And they disappear a little bit. Third is a little more like a, a camera that's filming something that's happening in front of it. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, exactly. It can be, it can be very objective. 
Um, and in this case, you know, I, I write with the kind of, you know, it's the standard mode, I think, of contemporary fiction, which is, you know, third person in free and direct style, you know, so it's, you know, the, the voiciness that's in the narrator is Henry's, you know, it's, it's tethered by a, by an elastic band to, to Henry's voice. Um, it can move out, it can, it can be more eloquent than Henry, but it can also, you know, the diction is never going to stray too far from Henry's world. Um, the words aren't going to be too far outside what Henry would, would say or think or feel. Fascinating. So, yeah. How is it the book is, you know, the book is going out in the world and you said you're, you're struggling on with another book, despite, despite the existence of your daughter, you're still pressing on, right. there's more, there's more to write. And, and how is that feeling going on to another story? Um, it's, it's a little crazy now. I mean, it's, you know, I, um, the, the, the daughter, my daughter was born, the book sold about a month or two later, you know, the, my, my, my baby baby and my book baby happened at roughly the same time, you They're know? Twins. Yeah, they are. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and that alone would have completely turned my world upside down. But then we also, you know, moved out to California from Boston, um, uh, you know, to be closer to my wife's family and, and childcare and all of that stuff. Um, so the, this past couple of years have been just cataclysmic change, you know? Um, and, uh, and I, you know, I think it's, it's been a lot to get adjusted to. So I, I'm very much like, um, I sort of live and die by Flaubert's maxim about like, keep your, keep your life orderly so that your, your work can go wild, you know, mm. um, and my life has been anything but orderly lately. And, um, and, um, I'm, I'm very much a process, very much a routine person. Um, uh, I don't sit around and wait for inspiration when I'm searching for the most productive routines, you know, the most productive way of living. Uh, and I haven't found that yet. You know, I think we're very still unmoored. We're still trying to, you know, we don't really have a home here in California yet. Um, I don't even have a desk. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you right now, sitting wow. on the f floor of our um, bedroom uh, on a, in, with my computer up on a bench next to the window. You know, that's what I got right now. Um, so, um, so it's, it's been a struggle. Um, and, so what I'm really focusing on now is kind of, you know, you know, get, getting our lives sort of set up here, um, you know, getting our own place, getting an office, um, uh, you know, and having clear boundaries, you know, uh, our daughter's starting, you, you thought you were asking a question about craft. <laughs> 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 no, but this is real. This, this is what it takes to yeah. write a book. Exactly. This is real. Um, I mean, this, this is as much about writing a book as any of the other stuff. Um, no, I think, you know, the, the borders in our lives have been very muddy lately. You know, uh, we've both been working from home. Katie's been working from home. Uh, we live with our, you know, with our, my mother-in-law. Um, but we are what we're so, you know, Katie's back to full time now. Um, just that is a recent happening. Uh, our girl is now going to daycare two days a week and that's going to kind of increase. So she's going to be at school. So what, and then we're going to find her own place. So what that will happen is that we'll have her own place. Katie will be at work. Girl will be at school and I've got time to write. You know, it's like Amazing. the, the boundaries are, are clear. That needs to happen first. Now that's not to say I'm not, I'm just like not writing. I'm, I'm still trying to put in whatever time uh, sitting on the floor by the window I can to, 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 to do some, to try to, you know, play with words, do something. A lot of that time has really been, you know, devoted to Cape May related things like marketing stuff. And, you know, that, you know, they, they want me to write some essays and stuff, but, um, but, but, uh, you know, so I'm not doing nothing, but, um, I don't think I'll be able to productively write fiction for a little bit still. Totally fair. And it's actually so good timing because that marketing stuff is, it's easier to do under those circumstances. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. So this is real people. You can get a book out and you can make it happen. Even if you're sitting on the floor with a bench by the window, That's you've right. heard it here first. <laughs> well, I uh, want to thank you so, so much for, for talking so in depth about the process of creating this book, which is, it's, course. it's a really, really great read. So I know everyone's going to enjoy it, but it's even more exciting to hear what it took to get it, to get it written. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you so, so much for, for reading the book and for taking the time to talk to me and for having me on, on your show. Thank you for listening to the Secret Library podcast. The show is produced by me, Caroline Donahue, and Frederick Barry McWilliams Jr., my tireless audio engineer. To get show notes for this episode and all other episodes, please visit secretlibrarypodcast.com. 
To get updates, literary love, and notification when new episodes are posted, sign up there for Footnotes, my newsletter. And to learn about life coaching with me to work on building your writing life, visit carolinedonahue.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend. Gold stars to everybody who leaves a rating and review on iTunes. We're so grateful. Until next time, happy reading.